Good afternoon, those of you that haven't joined us before. I'm Mark Stewart. I'm a director of RSK Geosciences Business, and I'd like you to I'd like to welcome you all to the latest in our Down to Earth webinar, which today is being given by my colleague John Findlay from Carbon Zero Consulting. He's going to give us a presentation on ground source heat. Firstly, I'd like to run through some brief housekeeping. Time. <laughs> so um, all attendees microphones are on muted throughout the webinar. During the presentation you can post questions and there'll be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can um, but if we can't answer any questions due to time constraints or we don't have the answer we will get back to you individually afterwards. Um, shortly after the webinar, you'll receive a, a link to a short survey so we can fill this in and give us some feedback so we can improve on future webinars. That'd be much appreciated. So without further ado, I'll introduce John Finley, who's going to be presenting to us this afternoon. John has been working in the ground source heat pump sector for over 20 years and has been involved in aspects of design and regulation of many of the larger systems operating in the UK today. He has been a member of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association Council for 10 years and has played a significant role in the development of standards and codes of practice within the sector. So I will pass over to John. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, oh, sorry. welcome to our uh, introduction to ground source heating and cooling. Um, I will try in the next 30 minutes to give you a background to the technology that is going to play a very important role in um, reducing our impact on the environment in terms of uh, carbon um, and reducing our consumption of fossil fuels. Um, so we'll be looking at some of the techniques for um, uh, taking heat from the ground or storing heat in the ground using closed loop systems, open loop systems, water source systems, and a very quick look at regulation and district heating. So, in brief, our UK policy, in fact, global policy really, is um, for, for energy, um, for, for heat provision. Affordability, resilience and security are extremely relevant at the moment. Um, affordability of, uh, of, of gas and oil. I'm sure um, we're all feeling the pinch with the uh, recent uh, incredible increases in the price of uh, fossil fuel and electricity. And of course, resilience and security, where our fossil fuels come from. The UK currently produces about 50% of its own gas. The rest comes from the Middle East and yes, a little bit comes from Russia. Um, so that just shows that um, there is a big question going forward about the resilience and security of our supply. But the biggest, uh, the, the biggest issue we're all facing is the one bottom right carbon reduction. Um, and heat pumps of one form or another, the electrification of heat, the removal of fossil fuels from our um, menu of, uh, of means of providing heating, it, um, heat pumps will provide a huge means of reducing our, our impact on the environment. So why do we need renewables? So by renewables, I mean renewable heating, renewable cooling, renewable power. Uh, for centuries, we've used coal, wood, oil and gas. Um, those resources are finite. And as I've said, we only produce about 50% of our domestic gas now. Um, cost. Um, yes, we all, uh, we're all feeling the pinch. Um, the cost of gas used to, well, it used to be quite cheap believe it or not, um, but it, it isn't anymore. And you know, who knows what the price of gas will be in two years, 10 years, 25 years. And where does it come from? It, it comes from some politically uh, volatile places. Um, and uh, you know, with the, the situation with Russia and Ukraine, it's, uh, it's brought, it in, brought it to the fore for everybody. Renewable heat and power and renewable energy is, re is, is just that, it's renewable and it's available anywhere. Um, it's going to make a huge contribution to our carbon reduction targets. Um, the, and the costs of um, producing renewable power via uh, photovoltaic, wind, tidal, um, uh, hydroelectric are falling because of the increased uptake, whilst the, the costs for um, fossil fuels are increasing. 
nuclear big question nuclear fission that's the, the way we produce electricity these days with nuclear very expensive and in the uk unfortunately we now rely on foreign expertise foreign engineering uh, expertise to do it for us despite the fact it was our technology to start with um so you know, there are some many drawbacks with nuclear but i think we are well we certainly are going to require um, nuclear power for, for decades to come as a to run parallel with the renewables and to um, yes, to to provide power when some renewable technologies are not available. So heat pumps, um, heat pumps come as air source heat pumps or ground source. Today I'm only talking about ground source. Heat pumps move heat from a cool place, a cold place, to a hot place, just the same as your fridge does in your kitchen. So um, they are mainly electrically driven, which means that they use electricity to drive themselves, but they produce much more heat energy than they consume in the form of electrical energy. So just looking at that little uh, figure at the bottom there, it shows that uh, the heat pump might be taking energy from the air or from the ground. Um, it takes that energy through a heat exchanger, the blue one there called an evaporator. Um, that the heat that you've brought in from the ground will slightly change the phase of the vapor into a gas that gas is then squashed by a compressor that round thing at the top there the compressor uses electricity that's the consumption bit that's where it uses electricity it makes that gas very hot goes to the other heat exchanger there called the condenser and it's that heat that finds its way into your house your building your school your whatever it is so that's what a heat pump does. And that example has a COP, coefficient of performance of four, which means that um, it's using one quarter of the amount of electricity as heat it produces. So four units of heat for every unit of, of, of electricity consumed. Heat pump systems, you know, their, their efficiencies vary, but you know, it's somewhere between three and a half and four quite commonly compared to a boiler, which is, has an efficiency of perhaps 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So we use electricity. At the moment, um, the electricity that we utilize um, comes from gas power stations, comes from nuclear power stations. Um, that little uh, thing on the right there is a screen grab from my from an app on my phone showing where the, um, how our power is being produced at the moment. So mostly gas, followed by wind, solar, and nuclear. 10, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you would have seen coal up at the top there, which means that the carbon intensity of the electricity produced by, um, by our power stations was way higher than it is now. That number there of 170 something is the amount of carbon produced for every kilowatt hour unit of electricity produced by our power stations. That used to be over 500. On some days now, on a sunny, windy day, that's below 100. So our target as a country is to get that down to zero, or as close to zero as we possibly can, by using renewables rather than burning fossil fuels. So heat pumps produce heat and cool. They need a method of connecting to the ground to obtain heat energy from the ground so that figure there is a slice through the ground that's a borehole drilled into 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 the rock formations let's say that borehole is 200 meters deep you've drilled your borehole you put in a u-tube of plastic pipe that's the, the blue and sort of uh, reddish color and then you fill that borehole with a, a grout uh, up to surface so that uh, that plastic pipe is grated into the ground forevermore it's then connected to the heat pump and you might have one borehole you might have hundreds so uh, you turn your heat pump on the heat pump circulates the fluid within that plastic pipe and starts to take heat energy out of that flow of, uh, of fluid so the temperature in that fluid reduces so you've got cold water let's say going into that pipe into the ground so that means that heat will flow from the ground into that pipe and then will be transferred into that cold heat exchanger that i showed you before 
and then that, that heat energy continuously moves across the heat pump into the other heat exchanger and ends up in your building. So a quarter of the energy uh, to run the system is electrical energy. About three quarters of it comes from the ground. And where does that heat in the ground come from? Ultimately, the sun. So the vast majority of energy that you take from the ground, from a ground source heating system, comes from the sun. A little bit comes up from the, from the Earth's interior, I've shown at the bottom there, geothermal energy. And some is carried across your borehole system via the flow of groundwater. Now the ground temperature in the UK is somewhere between 10 and 12 degrees, warmer in some of the cities, much warmer in London. It can be sort of 14, 15 degrees at surface in London. And that reflects the average air temperature wherever you are in, in the world. So in the UK, ground temperature is somewhere between 9 and 12 degrees from north of Scotland down to the south of England. So you can't use that heat directly, you need a heat pump. So what's a closed loop borehole look like? That very exciting photo is a closed loop borehole, about 150, up to 150 millimetres in diameter. There's a driller's boot toe cap there for, for scale. So once you've drilled it, put your YouTube pipe in, grated it up to surface, what we see is two bits of pipe sticking up like that. Then, um, so as I say, you might have one borehole, you might have hundreds of them, depending on how big your system is. Um, so those are all connected together to your system of heat pumps to provide heating and cooling to your building. So closed loop drilling needs to be fast because you, you, you need to drill many boreholes very quickly for it to be uh, economically viable. So you're generally aiming to, to, to drill at least a borehole a day. You know, on, on very large schemes, you might have two or three rigs drilling. It's important to know that closed loop boreholes can also store energy, store heat, store cool. So if you, if you are heating and taking heat out of the ground, you're, you're creating a cold bubble, if you like, in the rock around that borehole. Um, that can be used later, later on, let's say in the summer, for cooling. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And in reverse, if you're cooling, you're heating up the ground, that can be stored in the ground for later when you need heating. A few pictures of what closed loop drilling looks like, not particularly big rigs. Now, as I say, you're only drilling borehole diameters of up to about 150 millimetres. So, you know, fairly, fairly standard size rig. So to drill a closed loop borehole, you don't need any consent, you don't need uh, any of the regulators to give you permission to drill. You can, in most circumstances, turn up with a drilling rig and drill a borehole to 100 metres, 200 metres, 300, 400 metres if you want, um, and with no regulatory oversight. So if there is no regulator or anybody else looking at looking over your shoulder or you know, requiring certain, uh, certain standards or certain uh, methods of drilling, how do you know what you're drilling into and how do you know how you're going to do it? Well, you get the right people to do it for you, obviously. Um, but you must know what you're drilling into. You know, firstly, the UK is a very busy place. There are many buried services which you have to find first and uh, make sure that you've got clearance to, to be drilling where you're drilling. Secondly, you have to know your geology very well. The only, the only permit you, you may need is if you are drilling in an area of known uh, coal extraction. That's quite a lot in the, uh, of the UK has been mined, so in some areas you do need to get permission from the coal authority. So the, the UK's geology is incredibly complex. Um, that's just a picture of, uh, of the geology. Um, that's the hard rock geology at a very large scale. It is a lot more complex than that at a, at a higher scale. Add on to that the fact that we have been glaciated many times um, and that uh, there are glacial deposits smeared over the top of that hard rock geology uh, from the tip of Scotland down to about the Midlands of England. So it can be very difficult knowing what you're going to drill into. So um, get the right advice very early in, your, in, in the design process, very early in, the, in, in, the, in the, as soon as you start to think, right, ground sources, what we're going to go for here. How can we use ground source? What's the best method for, you for, for uh, drilling? What are we going to be drilling into? Some of the real issues, if you like, of, uh, of a ground source system, um, of a closed loop borehole, 
Once you've drilled the borehole into the ground, you've created a connection from surface down to whichever, whatever depth you're drilling into. So, the, um, as I've mentioned, the plastic U-tube is lowered into the borehole. It is then sealed up with a very low permeability bentonite thermally enhanced grout. Now, thermally enhanced means it's got sand and other additives in it to increase its thermal conductivity. And it's made, it's mainly made of bentonite clay, which is very low permeability, which, which stops the flow of any uh, surface water or any groundwater moving between one, uh, one aquifer or another. So again, be very aware of your geology. There are all sorts of geological hazards, um, which I've mentioned, mining, artesian water, etc. Those risks can be minimized. But you know, geology is is um, is a science, and um, you need the right expertise. The knowledge you need to design a closed loop system starts with an excellent knowledge of what the bolt building needs in terms of heating and cooling. So that's peak heating, cooling, measured in kilowatts or megawatts, and the amount of energy that it uses over the course of a year. Every building is different. Every house is different. People want their houses and want their offices at different temperatures, occupy their offices and shops for different numbers of hours. You have to know what the peak is, what the, what the total amount of energy over the course of a year is going to be. And you need to need to know the thermal properties of the ground you're drilling into. The thermal properties of the ground can be assessed not near by a desktop and, uh, investigation, but then at some point you're going to have to drill a borehole and test it, a thermal response test. Using that, those results and the building physics, you then feed that information into a computation or a, a, a ground model. Um, and this is a typical output, so this is uh, looking down on um, a building which uh, has had uh, 16 closed loop boreholes drilled to provide all the heating for that building. And that's the output of the, the typical output of the model there, showing the efficiency of the system and the variation of the temperature in the in the loop seasonally over uh, the course of uh, 20 years. So as closed loop boreholes, closed loop horizontal or shallow systems use pretty much all the same principles. You know, you, it's, it's plastic pipe filled with water and an antifreeze solution. But this time in, in a trench, typically a meter, 1.2 meters deep. Um, collecting solar energy from the ground and moving it to your heat pump. So all the same sort of thing. The main difference being that because it's so shallow, you can't really store heating, heat or cool energy because you, know, you have an interface with the atmosphere. So you know, if, if, if you were to try to store heat in such a shallow system, you would lose, lose quite a lot of it. Now shallow systems come in various geometries um straight pipe you know, up and back in a trench like shown there or slinky as shown top right um typically used for domestic applications you know so a few tens of kilowatts of uh, peak heating but there are plenty of very big systems you know a megawatt or more providing heating to for agricultural uh, uses or for you know for, for larger buildings A few pictures of uh, some of the um, ways pipe can be laid into the ground. Again, you need to know the properties of your soil. Uh, the, the thermal conductivity of the of, of, of soil can vary quite considerably. So always best to measure it in situ, so that you can put that parameter in with your known building um, um, heating requirements and model how much trench, how much pipe you need to meet your building's heating requirement. So you need to know lambda, that's the soil thermal conductivity. The diggability, you know, how easily um, can, you, can you dig trenches? Um, not always easy in some parts of the UK. Um, and uh, you also need to know what the average temperature of your soil is. Um, this, uh, you can get good records from the, from the Met Office um, and other local records as well. Um, examples of closed loop. You know, there are thousands of domestic closed loop horizontal and vertical systems um, feeding um, houses, um, schools, shops, whatever. Um, there are many hundreds of private and social housing scheme developments, you know, blocks of apartments, housing estates, etc., all using closed loop boreholes or trenches, and also commercial developments, retail, hotels, you name it. 
And there's many, many out there in the UK and many more elsewhere in the world. Open loop systems. Open loop is a very different beast. Open loop systems, well, let me go back. Closed loop boreholes can be used pretty much anywhere. If you can drill a borehole and put a put plastic pipe in it, you can, you can use closed loop. Open loop requires an aquifer, the presence of an aquifer, a water bearing uh, rock formation. So um, in order to, to ascertain whether you have an asset, uh, a, a suitable aquifer, you need the right ex um, expertise again, you need geology and hydrogeology. The main aquifers in the UK are the, the chalk in the southeast uh, of, the, of England, sandstone across the Midlands and southern Scotland, and you also have limestone and more local shallow sand and gravel um, aquifers associated with rivers and uh, estuaries. What does groundwater look like? We've all seen it. Have you ever drunk, drunk out of a, a water bottle? That's groundwater. Um, so you use groundwater directly in an open system rather than indirectly in a closed loop system or a, a plastic pipe. An open loop system consists of an abstraction borehole where you're pumping water out of one borehole. It might be 20 meters deep, it might be 300 meters deep, depending entirely on the geology. That water is pumped through a heat exchanger where your heat pump, the cold bit of your heat pump, takes heat out of that flow of water and moves it across the heat pump and into your building. So your now cooled flow of groundwater moves on is, and is then re-injected back into another borehole, generally located a few, you know, one, 200 meters away, into the same aquifer. So all you've done is moved water from one borehole via a heat exchanger into another one. You've borrowed that water and change its temperature. You've reduced its temperature if you're heating your building, you've increased its temperature if you're cooling your building. And the simplest form of an open loop system is two boreholes, one for abstraction, one for re-injection. You may have several pairs, depending on aqua properties and how big your, your project is. So the system is non-consumptive. You're not consuming water from the aquifer, you're just borrowing it. So, and a couple of pictures again, that's a picture of a borehole being drilled, that's groundwater being pumped out of the, the borehole as it's being drilled, carrying quite a lot of sand with it. Um, and so rigs need, are generally a, a bit bigger than closed loop rigs because they're drilling at larger diameters. And you know, to, um, requires different skill sets from the drillers and from the designers. In the right circumstances, open loop systems can meet very high demands. You know, in, in a good aquifer with uh, with high flow rates, high sustainable flow rates, you can meet some very high heating and cooling demands. It's just a, a little map there to show some some of the open loop systems in central London, ones that are in and ones that uh, are planned. Um, open loop is generally more sort of viable, if you like, um, for, for larger schemes, although there are plenty of domestic um, larger schemes, so you know, a couple of hundred kilowatts up to multi-megawatt systems, that's where open loop comes it, into its own. Closed loop boreholes are drill, put your pipe in, grout it up, cover them over, forget. They're there for 50, 100, 200 years until somebody digs them up. Open loop boreholes are different because you're pumping, they are living things if you like they need observation they need need maintenance um now and again you can have to change a submersal pump in one and um, you might need some uh, refurbishment rehabilitation of injection ball holes as well so open loop design and drilling fundamentally different different skill sets and you must involve the right expertise very start of your your project um the grand source heat pump association have a code of practice uh, with SIPSI. Uh, there's also some good practice guidelines from the Grand Source Implementation as well for open loop. So just as an example, um, the energy available from an open loop system, um, just a, a flow rate of 10 liters a second, fairly significant flow. Um, I won't go over the maths of that, of that, but it's a very simple equation. Um, via a heat pump with a, a flow of about 10 liters a second, you're going to get something like 230, 250 kilowatts of heating, um, a slightly different number of cooling. So um, that's the order of uh, how much water you need to provide a significant amount of heat. Thermal interference, again, I'm not going to run through that, uh, the detail of that slide. But, um, um, when you abstract water from one borehole, 
change its temperature and re-inject it to another, you want to keep those two, you want to keep that water separate, if you like, because if, if the water you've re-injected all comes back to your abstraction borehole, in time, the temperature of water you're taking from your borehole will reduce or increase, depending on if you're heating or cooling, and you don't want that. So you want to keep your, your two boreholes as far apart as possible, um, but not always possible. Um, and if, if you can separate them by, by hundreds of meters, then the, the thermal interference will be very little and the system will run happily for many, many years. The other solu better solution is to have an excellent balance of heating and cooling. If, if the amount of heating going into your building pretty much ba balances with the amount of cooling, then the net heat extraction from the ground is zero or close to zero. So you're not going to change the temperature of your groundwater over the course of a year very much. So you can do much more with an open loop system and indeed a closed loop system if, you're, if your building requires a good balance of heating and cooling. Some open loop examples, ones that um, we've worked on in the last 10, 15 years. Um, there's an open loop system using eight boreholes, four for abstraction, four for reinjection for a large plant nursery near Hull, a very posh hotel and spa in Yorkshire, um, as in, is entirely heated and cooled, and it's all for supply coming from the ground as well, using ground source heat pumps. Luton College is one that was done um, back in uh, we did 2009-10. That's still running very nicely. One new change of the large retail centre in London, um, and many more. Um, I think the largest one that I know of in the UK at the moment, openly boreholes, is a large herb grower in Lincolnshire, which is uh, at least three megawatts, but has the capacity for a lot more. Um, now Stonehenge Visitor Centre, Trafford Town Hall, various others are run on what is known as ATES. That's aquifer thermal energy storage. So basically it's an open loop system, but it's reversible. So let's say in the winter, you're pumping from uh, one borehole, heating your building. So you're reducing the temperature of water, um, a bubble of, you're forming a bubble of cooled water in your injection borehole or boreholes. Then in the summer, you reverse the system. You start pulling out of that cooled uh, pool of water through your heat pump for cooling and back into um, what was your abstraction borehole and start to form a warmed bubble of water. So in the winter, you start using that warmed bubble of water for your heating. You can, in, in, you can increase the efficiency of your system hugely by using um, an ATES system and a, a well-balanced uh, heating and cooling demand from the building. Water source systems vastly underutilized in this country. Um, yeah, we have many rivers, um, we have lakes, we're an island, we're surrounded by the sea. So um, water source systems use rivers, estuaries directly, either closed loop or open loop again. Um, these two pictures, that funny frame on bottom left is currently sitting on the bottom of the River Thames at Kingston. Um, and it, uh, one, one of those battles takes water in through the heat pump and blows it back out again the other one. That large uh, construction you can see bottom right is an eight megawatt uh, system uh, that's been running for two years and is providing heat to a soft fruit grower. Water source heat pumps have huge potential. Um, there's a, a, a code of practice by Ground Source Heat Pump Association, SIPSI, which uh, was available. Um, the one design uh, drawback, I suppose you'd call it, is that when you're trying to heat, the, the, the temperature of water in your river is going to be at its lowest. When you're trying to cool, the temperature of water in your river is going to be at its highest. So it does work against you, but these systems are still hugely efficient. Some more pictures of uh, a couple of the systems, of that eight megawatt system that's operating at the moment. So that's open loop where you're abstracting water, changing its temperature, putting it back into the river. Closed loop, again, uses plastic pipe or heat exchange panels. So you can see plastic pipe being floated out there into a, into a, a lake. It'll, they'll then be sunk onto the bottom where they'll carry on doing their heat exchange. And those metal panels, which do the same thing. Um, so 
Uh, it, you might, it might be a 10 gigawatt system, it might be a multi megawatt system. The largest one in the UK at the moment, I think, is about a three megawatt heating and cooling system for um, a hospital up in Mansfield using um, the reservoir that sits in front of the hospital. That gives you an idea of the range of, uh, of temperature of a, the river. That's the River Trent at Trent Bridge in Nottingham. So you can see it since 1980 something, it's varied from as low as very briefly two to three degrees centigrade and as high as 25 degrees centigrade. You can see the average temperature there of that period is going up. Good news for heating systems using rivers. So water source systems are regulated by the Environment Agency uh, in the same in a, in a different way to boreholes, um, but yes, so if you take water out of the river, change its temperature and put it back in again, you need uh, a license and a permit. A closed loop system, again, does not need a license, but you will need some permissions to actually work on the river, river bank. Uh, you might need an ecological survey and flood risk activity permit. So just to go over very briefly, yes, that's the regulatory framework in uh, England and Wales. It's slightly different in Scotland. So open loop systems are regulated, closed loop systems are not. I won't go over the, uh, the detail of that, but um, uh, the, the entire regulatory system is about to change. At the moment, you need an abstraction license to take water out of a borehole or a river and a permit to put it back in again. It's all going to be brought into the environmental permitting regulations. So um, that will be happening sometime in the next couple of years. Scotland is a bit more straightforward. They use general binding rules there, a bit more pragmatic, I would say. Quick um, note on cooling. Ground source heat pumps are excellent for cooling as um, uh, it, it's a byproduct, if you like, um, but um, you know, a system that uses heating and cooling is the most efficient means of heating and cooling any building. Um, once, you, once you've operated um, a ground source system in heating mode for, you know, for the heating season, you then have a, a, a cooled resource to be used for cooling in, in, that, in that coming summer. Um, so the start of your cooling season, you could actually use passive cooling where you're not even using your heat pump compressor. You're just passing cooled water through a heat exchanger. Very, very efficient indeed. District heating, very, very big subject at the moment. So ground source heating systems lend themselves very well to, to district heating, either ambient loop district heating systems or high temperature uh, uh, district heating systems. Um, the borehole array that you use, be it closed loop or, or open loop, very long term is a utility asset and should be thought of as such and funded as such. You know, a closed loop borehole array is in the ground forever. It's plastic pipe, it's going to be there forever. Open loop systems, if they're maintained and run properly, they're going to be there for a very long time as well. You know, 25, 50 years, some boreholes that we've worked on from old factories um, have been nearly 100 years old. So these, these are very long term utility assets. So that comes to an end of uh, the presentation and uh, yes we'll be very happy to, uh, to um, accept your questions and uh, we'll do our very best to answer them. Thank you John, that was a, that was a, a really enlightening talk and I think from the number of um, attendees we've had we can see it's, it's a really popular subject at the moment. And so I've got some questions are coming for you. I'll start with the first one. Um, typically, what is the lifespan of closed loop four holes and trenches um, and also of open loop systems? OK, well, I, I touched on that. Um, as we all know, plastic lasts pretty much forever in the, in the environment. Um, so a closed loop borehole um, with plastic loop in, in, installed, as long as nobody dig, digs it up, it's there forever. It's you know 100 years at least. Um, trenches the same, but I suppose a little more um, uh, vulnerable if, because they're only a meter or so down. So again, yeah. as long as nobody mechanically in interferes, then um, yes, it's they're, they're there for a very long time. Possibly longer than the building they're serving, then. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, very much so, and that's why they should be regarded as you know as a long term utility asset you know a, a set of boreholes supplying let's say a village via a district heating system 
it's going to be there for a very long time and needs to be funded in the similar way as gas pipelines are or you know, electrical um, electricity um, distribution networks. It, we just need to think of um, the use of boreholes to access heat in a very different way. Um, are ground source heat pumps more expensive than boiler equivalents? Yes, they are. Um, they are very much more expensive um, because uh, a ground source heat pump, you're drilling or you're, 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 you're excavating trenches. Um, so you know, um, a, a heat pump project is more expensive than, than a boiler equivalent. Um, but the paybacks, when you can, when, when you compare to um, if you were running on oil or LPG, are still pretty good. All right, there you know, might be somewhere between four and ten years. Um, but the the huge advantage you have is is the carbon reduction. Um, you have a, compared to gas, the carbon reduction of a, of a, of a heat pump is somewhere between sixty and eighty percent, um, and also longevity. As I said, you know, your, your your means of extracting heat from the ground is very long lived. Um, heat pumps also last for a very long time um, if they're maintained correctly. Um, but there's no getting away from the fact that you know, the ground source heat pump is a more expensive uh, um, project, but uh, has very long term um, advantages and you know, carbon emission huge advantages. Yeah, there is a question I can follow up with about what maintenance is required for these systems. Sorry, could you repeat that? What maintenance is required for these systems? Closed loop, very little. Closed loop boreholes need no uh, maintenance. Uh, once they're in the ground, you can cover them over with a car park or you know, grass, do whatever you like. So the borehole, the, 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 the ground array, no maintenance at all. Heat pumps, plant room, just standard maintenance. It's um, you know, just uh, um, uh, checking out pressures, temperatures, uh, leaky, leakage and um, uh, but uh, the the fluid within your your system is uh, it, it, it's staying within the parameters that's uh, required in terms of um, its uh, its temperature capability. So it, it's, it has antifreeze in it, and um, uh, you also have a, a bio side to make sure that no uh, no biological growth occurs in in the in the pipes. But yeah, it's it's standard sort of. Um, m and &E building services maintenance within the plant room. Yeah, there's a question on how are they maintained, but I think you probably just answered that. Um, if we've got to. Um, it's flooding in now. Uh, <laughs> open loop sounds more complex effort to maintain than closed loop. What are the benefits to open loop and why would you choose this over a closed loop system? Yes. It is more complex. It's there's a lot more involved. The advantages are in the right location, and I stress you have to have the right location, and that means that you have to have the right sort of aquifer beneath the site, and that aquifer needs to have certain properties in terms of how much water it can give and what the quality of the water is. But if those are met, and there are quite a few parts of the UK where where those 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 um, quality requirements are met, then Open loop is hugely efficient. You might just have two boreholes, all right, very different design boreholes to closed loop, but you might have just one abstraction borehole, one injection borehole, will produce many hundreds or or even you know a megawatt or so of heating and cooling. Um, the the, the um, alternative would be many tens or hundreds of closed loop boreholes, um, whereas open loop, as I say, one, two, three pairs of boreholes might do the same job. Um, yes, you do need to, uh, uh, to to keep an eye on them and maintain them, but um, yeah, uh, there are examples of open loop systems now running for you know, 10, 20 years. Okay, uh, quite a long question here, but it seems to be asking about, can it be combined with um, solar um, and energy storage? Um, um, and what are the main factors that make this type of energy competitive? Can it be combined with solar? Um, yes, closed loop systems. There are some systems which use excess heat from um, PVT or, or uh, you know, hot water systems to recharge heat into the ground. Um, they can be run with photovoltaic panels, but of course, um, you know, the, the, 
the, the major output from PV photovoltaic panels is during the summer when you need least heat, and uh, you know, during the day when your um, when your, your heat pump would be running less. Um, but uh, you can use um, storage to displace um, some of the electrical consumption that a heat pump system would use, which of course greatly increases the efficiency and uh, um, reduces the long-term cost of your system. Um, they are the you know, ground source heat pumps can also be used alongside other um, uh, means of heating. So you, know, you can use or re retain a gas boiler to run alongside your heat pump. Um, the way that, uh, that, that, that that sort of system works is that you know, your boiler might, might be there to meet the 10% peak heating requirement. Um, and if you look at a low duration curve, that means that uh, a ground source heat pump would actually be doing something like 90% of the work during the year. 90% of the energy would come from the ground source and 10% from your backup boiler. So uh, you can reduce the amount of, uh, of boreholes and infrastructure you need by retaining a boiler um, to do a small amount of work, just peak lopping if you like, and the, the ground source heat pump does the majority of, of the work during the course of the year and will do cooling besides. Okay, do you know if there are any issues related to mortgaging properties or legal implications? Oh, I'm no lawyer. Um, but, you know, uh, if you own the, the, the heat pump and you own the land that the heat pumps are on, then yes, that, 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 that goes along with the, uh, with the property. Okay. Are borehole systems less common in coal mining areas due to possible risks and uncertainties associated with working? Um, there are many in coal mining, mining areas, actually. Um, some of the largest projects going on at the moment are in Newcastle, Leeds, where there are many, many uh, uh, mines. Um, we just need to, 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 to find you know, designer and drillers that are capable of drilling through um, mined um, coal measures, sandstones and mudstones and coals. Um, some areas are obviously more difficult than others, um, but no, you can put in closed loop systems um, in, in mined areas. And indeed, there's a lot of research now going on by BGS and others, and there's a couple of projects now operating using flooded uh, mine shafts and, uh, and addicts and actually pumping water from them through a heat pump and then returning them back to other parts of the mine complex. So mines can be a problem, but they can also be an asset. Yeah, and to put a little plug in for geosciences there, you know, we've done lots of work in coal mining areas, so we're more than used to looking at risks and constraints in working in those parts of the country. Um, oh, 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 ball. Oh. Understand the question. Sorry, I missed that question. I don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> um, can they be? Can these be installed in piles? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. There are pile <laughs> systems. Um, there are um, examples all over the world of pile systems. Um, they quite often run alongside deeper closed loop borehole systems or even open loop. Um, one new change: the the large retail. Um, uh, building um, an office building near St Paul's uses uh, loops and piles, closed loop boreholes, and open loop. Um, the, yeah, the the thing to bear in mind with with piles is that they are they are relatively shallow, you know, 20, 30 meters deep, something like that. So you can't get the same amount of energy out of a pile as you could out of a two, three hundred meter borehole. Okay, one more. Um, what is the cost per kilowatt in comparison with other heating systems? Okay, um, completely project uh, specific, um, and again, closed and open loop specific. But you know, for, for larger commercial developments, you know, anything from three or four hundred pounds per kilowatt um, up to perhaps two thousand pounds per kilowatt for, for much smaller sort of um, uh, uh, bespoke systems. Um, the, the large water source system that I showed you taking water from the river is, um, uh, is, is hugely efficient, hugely cost efficient in terms of its capital cost and running costs. 
um, yes, the order of a few hundred pounds per kilowatt of, uh, of energy it produces. Okay, well, that's covered all the questions. Oh, hang on, no, there's more coming. Let me have a quick look. Um, is a thermal response test necessary? But for, not for domestic applications. Um, you know, we would normally say to, to run a thermal response test if there's more than you know, 10 boreholes. Um, so if your initial design using desktop uh, figures for thermal conductivity, say we're going to need you know, 10, 10 boreholes-ish, uh, we would recommend that you do a test borehole um, and do a thermal response test, or at least do a thermal response test on the first borehole that you're drilling. You then model against how much heating and cooling that building needs and refine how, how many boreholes you need to finish off. So um, not for not for the smaller schemes, but anything over you know, 10, around about 10 boreholes, yes, we would always recommend a, a, a TRT. Okay, there's a lot of talk about air source heat pumps being the new boilers. I mean, inverted commas. Why is this the case and not ground source heat pumps, do you think? Um, uh, ground source is applicable pretty much anywhere. Um, there are uh, locations where um, it is very difficult to get a drilling rig or very difficult to drill boreholes and connect those boreholes to whichever borehole you're looking at. And that's where air source is, is, is generally more applicable. Um, air source is a bit cheaper, it's a bit less efficient, and generally they are less long-lived. Um, there are other issues with it, you know, cold, cold air plumes and, uh, and um, the noise of the exterior fans, if you've got a lot of them all working together in you know, an apartment block or something. So air source has its place for sure, um, as does ground source, and either will work in new build or in refurbish um, in, uh, um, in, in all buildings, providing um, you've done all you can to uh, uh, increase the um, insulation, reduce the heat loss within your building. But um, yeah, there's a place for air source and ground source. It's just that ground source does require uh, more of a design input um, and costs are generally a bit higher. Okay. Um can closed and open loop systems be used together by a heat exchanger pumping warm water into the aquifer in summer months from a closed system? Uh, yes, matter of design. Um, as I said, there are a couple of systems which use closed and open loop. Um, but yes, um, you wouldn't generally put the two together uh, via the same heat exchanger, or I've not seen that, but um, yes, the, 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 there are applications where, as I've said, um, you utilize heat from the ground via uh, loops and piles or closed loop boreholes. And if you're also on a good aquifer, then you do utilize that as well. Um, they might be used for different purposes within that building or you know, that, uh, that development. But um, uh, yes, it would be a matter of design to work out how that's done. To, to, to work um, closely band open loop together, but yes, possible. Okay. Um, can they be used on contaminated sites? Uh, is there an issue with the risk of deterioration of the of the closed loops and pipes pipe work? Um, ooh, um, in terms of, it depends on the contamination where it is. Um, yeah. If if, you know, if there is gross contamination mobile contamination within an aquifer within the groundwater then it's likely that open loop would not be um, permitted by the environment agency of CEPA because you'd be moving it around. Um, if your contamination is is confined um, to open superficial deposits at surface then yes it is possible to to, uh, um, to have a closed loop borehole array provided you use certain drilling uh, processes, you, know, you, you case off the, the contaminated part, yeah. seal it off the ground and, and then drill oh, it. The question was more, was more about whether the contamination is going to um, impact the pipe the pipe work in the long okay. run, where the pipe's going to deteriorate. Um, cool. uh, Possibly, I mean, we look, we look at this for water source pipes in contaminated land all the time, so it might be something that Indeed, yes, it would depend very much on, on the type of solvent or whatever that's in the ground and how much of it there is. Yeah. Um, can you vary the pipe uh, material based on... Yes, there are, 
there are different pipe materials that can be used yeah mdpe hdpe um so yes it's um yeah as you say it's similar sort of questions with water supply uh, pipes um but uh, uh yes a very site site specific question if you like but um um it would have to um, be worked, uh, few more questions and we've still got a lot of people online so if you're happy to carry on answering we'll continue for a bit longer um any available lifestyle cycle data on ground source heat pumps eg carbon uh, cost savings over 20 years compared to boiler systems um there is information on the ground source heat pump association website um have a look on there um if not um I would certainly recommend emailing the Grain Source Heat Pump Association and asking for some data. Um, the, the, there is data out there, um, probably not as much as there should be, because a lot of systems aren't as well instrumented as uh, as, as I and others might like. Um, but um, yes, there there, there are um, many great examples of um, of, of, of uh, closed and open loop systems out there, which are greatly reducing the carbon uh, uh, output of, of the heating and cooling systems of those buildings. But yeah, I would recommend getting in touch with the GSHPA. Um, have you got any um, experience of installing ground source heat pumps um, in a doctable highway? In a highway? Um, no, not yet. Um, <laughs> certainly, uh, um, but... Uh, possible, no, you think? Uh, don't, I don't see why not. Um, you know, certainly blacktop car parks have been used for uh, uh, for shallow and for borehole arrays. Um, you know, there is some bit of research, I believe, to show that uh, you know, the blacktop does absorb heat a bit more, which is a good thing. Um, I would say, provided it is generally, it's better to be a permeable surface so that uh, you know rainwater does um, leach down into the soil if it's in a shallow system. Otherwise, you can end up with some very dry trenches which are not particularly thermally efficient but um in roads so i haven't seen that but um okay. um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you one more question and then we'll have to draw to a, a close is there a limit on how much more energy you can extract out of a single borehole and will there be any risk of freezing the ground someone was listening yes entirely um design uh, dependent yes you could uh, theoretically freeze the ground but that's the job of the designers to make sure we don't. So um, I think I showed you a, a sort of an aerial shot of the building and um, a dozen or so ball holes and a plot with a wiggly line on it. Um, that's the output of the model. Um, so you, the model takes in the heating and cooling requirements of the building and the thermal properties of the ground, and it, it, it works out how many ball holes you need to provide the heating and cooling to that building without dropping the temperature in the borehole field and in the ground below a certain minimum so it's it, it's it's a design issue um the whole point is to take as much heat as you can out of the ground without dropping the temperature below a certain limit okay well thank you for answering all those questions john um that was a really uh, a good session so uh, thank you all again for attending today we've had um, over 160 people online um, I'm sure lots more will, will view the uh, the video once it's posted up on YouTube. Uh, for our next webinar on the 7th of June, we'll be joined by my colleague from Geosciences, Helen McMillan, who's going to be talking about con the consideration of um, climate change in land contamination risk assessments. So we'll see you all next month. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.